Hello my lovely insiders. Today we shall be discussing dacryocystorhinostomy. In this video, we shall begin by talking about the local anesthesia employed in the lacrimal sac surgeries, following which I shall take you through a schematic journey of dacryocystorhinostomy where we deep dive into various steps of DCR surgery and important complications that might arise at every step. Next, we will explore other forms of DCRs to ensure that you have a comprehensive understanding. If you find our material useful, we would appreciate your support. The most effective means of showing that is to engage with us by liking this lecture, providing your thoughts in the comment section and following this channel. Your active participation is very much valued. So first, let us talk about the nerve blocks for DCR and DCT. The diagram displayed over here depicts the essential nerves that needs to be anesthetized. They include the intratrochlear nerve, the infraorbital nerve, the anterior ethmoidal nerve, and a branch of the anterior ethmoidal nerve, which is the dorsal nasal nerve. The anterior ethmoidal nerve is not visually represented in this diagram due to its extra conal position. However, its relevance and role shall also be discussed in the accompanying slides. So what is, the, what is the anesthesia that we use? A combination of 2% lignocaine and 0.5% bupivacaine with or without adrenaline is used for this purpose. And for an in-depth understanding of local anesthesia, please refer to our informative video on the same. Now, let us systematically examine each of these nerve blocks. We will initiate our discussion with the intratrochlear nerve. The infratrochlear nerve is basically a branch of the nasociliary nerve is located at the superior medial margin of the orbital cavity. This nerve is responsible for providing the sensory innovation to the bridge of the nose. One should actually palpate the supratrochlear notch first and more specifically the infratrochlear nerve resides approximately halfway between the inner canthus and the supratrochlear notch. The next nerve to discuss about is the infraorbital nerve. The infraorbital nerve basically originates from the infraorbital foramen, providing innovation to the lateral nose, skin over the cheek, and upper lip. Now, in order to block this nerve, one needs to palpate the infraorbital margin. Injection can then be applied just below the infraorbital margin, specifically one centimeter below the margin in the mid pupillary plane. Moving on to the dorsal nasal nerve. The dorsal nasal nerve is basically a dorsal branch of the anterior ethmoidal nerve and basically innovates the tip of the nose. In order to block this nerve, one basically needs to inject the drug at the junction of the nasal cartilage the junction of the nasal bone and the nasal cartilage about 6 to 9 mm away from the midline. Finally, let's discuss about the anterior ethmoidal nerve. As the picture depicts here, the anterior ethmoidal nerve is situated medially in the extraconal space. It is also a branch of the nasociliary nerve, which in turn is a branch of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. The anterior ethmoidal nerve basically arises in the orbit, as I showed you, it is present in the medial part of the extracoronal space arising from the nasociliary nerve. And from there, it enters first into the cranial cavity and then enters your nasal cavity. As one would note that it really doesn't become superficial to be so easily accessible for the nerve block. And therefore, a transcarancular approach is often employed to block the anterior ethmoidal nerve. By doing so, the drug, the anesthetic drug, is deposited in the medial extraconal space. The surgical procedures for the lacrimal sac, like the DCR and DCT, can indeed be conducted under general anesthesia as well. However, having familiarized ourselves with how to block these four nerves, let us now move forward and delve into the steps of dacrocystorhinostomy. So what is DCR? By now, we are all familiar with the flow of, tear, of tears through the lacrimal apparatus. With obstruction at the nasolacrimal duct level, the tears will actually flow back into the eye, leading to watering or epiphora. Now, in the process of dacrocystorhinostomy, as the term implied, 
we basically facilitate a new opening or an ostium for the flow of tears directly from the sac into the nasal cavity. This ostium is actually formed in the area of the lacrimal sac and extends into the lateral wall of the nose. Specifically, this is done in the area of the middle meatus. Okay, and this action essentially allows for a bypass of the tear and the fluid present within the sac directly into the nose and we are bypassing the blocked nasolacrimal duct. Okay, so as you can see here in this image, because of that ostium that we created in Dacrosis to rhinostomy, the tears can straight away pass into the nasal cavity without having to go through the blocked nasolacrimal duct. Based on the type of surgical technique which is used to create this ostium, DCR or dacrosisterhinostomy can be classified into different types. Now, if we approach the lacrimal sac through an external skin incision, then that process is referred to as an external DCR or a conventional DCR. However, in the procedure known as endonasal DCR, the method of creating an ostium involves an approach through the nose. Now here we utilize an instrument called an endoscope which serves as our viewing system and this instrument is going to be inserted into the nose. At the same time an illuminating lead pipe is inserted into the lacrimal sac via the puncta. Now this light will cause the lacrimal sac to glow assisting the surgeon in identifying the sac from the nose using the endoscope present in the nasal cavity. Now this is called your endonasal DCR. Now when a surgeon employs however a laser immediately to carve an opening via the canaliculus into the, into the lacrimal sac creating an ostium into the nose. Okay this procedure is referred to as the endocanalicular laser DCR. And there are various types of laser which can be used for this purpose and mainly the ones which are used are the homium yag laser and the diode laser. The method basically holds the considerable benefit of speed. Unlike the external DCR, it does not result in scarring because you're not creating any incision in the skin. Furthermore, because you're not taking any incision and you're using laser, this is a bloodless procedure that can be safely performed on elderly individuals who are on anticoagulants. Additionally, the recovery period is also relatively brief. However, it's worth mentioning that this technique does have a notable disadvantage and that is the lower success rate compared to your external and endonasal DCR. The success rate here, as you can observe, is just 70%. Now for a successful DCR surgery, it is very, very important that the lacrimal pump is operating normally. Now, as we discussed in our earlier lesson regarding the Jones dye test, the function of the lacrimal pump is very, very crucial. I suggest revisiting that material for further understanding. Additionally, the puncta, which is responsible for transporting the tears to the sac, should also be patent and also positioned ideally. It is also necessary for the canaliculi to be patent. Now, please ensure that you thoroughly understand and remember these points as they are very vital for the proper execution and success of your DCR surgery. Now, sometimes what happens is that the canaliculi might also be blocked along with the nasal lacrimal duct. Now, if your canaliculi are blocked up to say less than eight millimeters, a common surgical procedure is carried out which is called conjunctivo DCR or the conjunctivo dacrocystorhinostomy. Here, it is important to understand that DCR is executed in the usual way. However, given that we have a canaliculi uh, block, given that the canaliculi aren't functioning, an alternate pathway to the sac is needed to allow tears to finally reach the nasal cavity. So to do that, what we do is some portion of the carinkle is going to be removed to uh, achieve access to the lacrimal sac. Then as we have created a tract from the carinkle to the lacrimal sac, now a tube is going to be inserted and this tube is called the Lester Jones tube, which will be inserted into this newly formed tract and this tube will be left there permanently, right? So this is how we are basically bypassing 
the proximal canalicular obstruction along with the obstruction present at the distal level. So this procedure is called conjunctivo DCR and since we are placing a tube and the tube is Lester-Jones tube, this procedure is also called Lester-Jones procedure. Now let's deep dive into the external DCR. Before that, when do you do a DCR surgery? So DCR surgery is indicated in persistent congenital lacrimal duct obstruction, which do not respond to your previous uh, therapies. Apart from that, when you have mucosil, when you have dacrocystitis, primary acquired nasolacrimal duct obstruction, in which we have stenosis of the uh, nasolacrimal duct with age, or any causes of secondary acquired obstruction of the nasolacrimal duct. Apart from that, we must also know when we should not do a DCR surgery. So what are the contraindications of a DCR surgery? Patients who are on anticoagulant medications, patients who are unable to stop them perioperatively, those who have active dacrocystitis don't do a DCR surgery. Even in cases when you have tumors of the lacrimal sac, it is better to do a DCT surgery and remove the entire sac rather than trying to create an osteum. Now, there are certain preoperative tests that we must schedule prior to a DCR surgery as a part of preparatory procedures. These are the hemoglobin levels, bleeding and clotting time, blood pressure measurements, random blood sugars, additional general anesthesia investigations whenever required because many a times you might actually take the patient under uh, general anesthesia. Now, dacryocystorhinostomy is an intricate surgical procedure. It actually entails your working with a delicate nasal mucosa. Now this makes nasal packing a key part of the process. Its purpose is actually to maintain the tautness of the mucosa and elevate any discomfort because of the pain and bleeding. Now the nasal mucosa should be actually sprayed with say 10% lignocaine, about one to two puffs. And after that procedure is done, it should then be packed with a solution that contains 4% lignocaine or 0.5% xylometazolin, right? So you're anesthetizing and also you're putting some decongestants into the nose. Now, the diagram here demonstrates the three meatuses which are found within the nasal cavity. We have a superior meatus, a middle meatus, and an inferior meatus. Now, it is very essential to note that Forming of the ostium basically involves the region of the middle meatus in the DCR surgery and, and therefore it is paramount for this area of middle meatus to be properly packed and prepared. Additionally, the orientation of the nasal packing is of significant importance. Now, what happens is that when you insert the pack posteriorly, when you put your forceps with the pack in the posterior direction of the patient lying down, they tends to get lodged basically into the inferior meatus. However, if you direct it more superiorly, it will now go and lodge into the area where, where you need to create the ostium and that is your middle meatus. So consequently, the correct methodology for nasal packing therefore should be initially directing the pack superiorly, then you go posteriorly and then you come inferiorly. That way you will properly uh, lodge your packing into the middle meatus of the nose. Now, however, it is crucial to ensure that you do not place the pack too high up. If the nasal pack is inserted overly high, it could actually damage your cribriform plate, potentially leading to a condition which is called CSF rhinorrhea. Now, we will thoroughly examine each individual step involved in the DCR surgery while also discussing the variety of potential complications. The first step we need to take is to make a skin incision. Now this could either be a straight incision or a curved incision. We are basically looking at making a curvilinear incision of approximately say about 10 to 12 millimeters in length and this is placed at about 3 to 4 millimeters away from the medial canthus and running along the anterior lacrimal crest. Alternatively, we could also make a straight incision which should be at about 8, 8 to 9 millimeters away from the medial canthus. An important clinical point to remember for all of us is not to make an incision more than 2 millimeters above the medial canthus 
or do not extend the incision into the upper eyelid. If you do so, doing such can lead to undesired consequences like scarring or webbing of the skin. Now, the angular vein is situated at around 8 millimeters medial to the medial canthus. Now, sometimes it also gives a tributary at around 3 to 4 mm from the canthus. Now, in order to avoid excessive bleeding due to the angular vein trauma, remember not to exceed a boundary more than 3 millimeters medial to the medial canthus when executing the incision. Now, we discussed this point in our video on the lacrimal apparatus anatomy. In case you missed it, I would highly recommend reviewing the video provided. It's crucial to have a comprehensive understanding of the anatomy in order to fully grasp the processes undertaken in this particular surgical procedure. Now, following the incision of the skin, we come across the orbicularis muscle in our exploration. It becomes necessary to separate the orbicularis fibers, a task best accomplished through the use of blunt dissection. It's crucial to remember not to cut the fibers under any circumstances. Moving on, a pertinent point about this step that I need to emphasize here is not to cause damage to the orbicularis muscle fibers. The adverse effect of this action is damage to the lacrimal pump mechanism, which could consequently result in a failed DCR. So remember, dissect, carry out a blunt dissection, but do not cut those fibers. As you carry out the blunt dissection of the orbicularis or as you separate the fibers of orbicularis, you will come across a white glistening structure attached to the anterior lacrimal crest covering the fundus of the lacrimal sac and that is your medial palpable ligament. Okay, so do not dissect this ligament also. Try to disinsert it and then reflect it back. Now, do you have any idea how many limbs does an MPL has? So if you know, answer in the comment section. Now, the superior limb is the one that is most responsible for maintaining the contour of the medial canthus. As we don't meddle with this limb in the DCR surgery, we are only dealing with the anterior limb of the medial canthus ligament. This is the anterior, this is the posterior, and this is the superior limb. Right? So as we don't meddle with the superior limb, the counter of the medial canthus is usually not affected in a DCR surgery. Now, the fourth step. Upon reaching the medial palpable ligament, we proceed to disinsert it and subsequently we will come across the periosteum, which is the membrane that actually encompasses the underlying bone. Okay, so the fourth stage, therefore, will be exposing this periosteum as well as the anterior lacrimal crest. Now, at this stage also, you need to use a Freer's periosteal elevator, which is actually used to separate the periosteum from the bone. And then as you separate the periosteum from the bone, you will lift the periosteum from the bone and reflect it laterally. As you do so here, you can see you have lifted the periosteum medial palpable ligament and you have also lifted the sac along with it which was sitting nicely in the lacrimal fossa. Because of that, because of that lateral reflection, now what you can see here is the lacrimal fossa, right? So the end goal here is to reveal what we refer to as the lacrimal fossa because that's the area where we are going to make that osteum or we are going to make that entry into the nasal cavity. Now, the lacrimal fossa is basically made up of two bones. It is the frontal process of the maxillary bone, which is slightly thicker, and a thinner bone, which is the lacrimal bone. Now, the lacrimal bone is very thin and it is about 1 or 6 microns in thickness and it is easier to create uh, an osteum through it. Now, I want to emphasize the utmost importance point over here of reflecting the sac together with the periosteum during the surgery, right? So as we're separating the sac along with the periosteum, this process is called a subperiosteal dissection. Now, this technique is highly recommended as it reduces the risk of bleeding from the perilacrimal sac plexus 
a complication that could actually occur if we attempt to reflect only the sac using our instrument. So around your lacrimal sac, you have this perilacrimal plexus. So if you were not to remove the sac along with the periosteum, you will actually be touching this perilacrimal plexus and cause bleeding. As you know, in every video, we ask you a question and you guys give us the correct answer. So for the previous video, the correct answer, which was streptococcus pneumoniae causing ulcer serpents in a case of chronic dactylocystitis. And the correct answer was given by Shah Rukh Khan. So this shine out shout out actually goes to you. Well done, Shah Rukh. Now, the fifth point is the creation of a bony osteum. Right? Now, to begin with, you will want to carefully fracture a slender sutural line that lies between the frontal region of the maxilla and the lacrimal bone. And this is that suture that I'm talking about. Now, this will actually facilitate your access into the nasal cavity, allowing you to observe the nasal mucosa underneath it. Right. So under normal circumstances, what happens is that the lacrimal sac area or the lacrimal fossa is basically divided equally by the maxilla and the lacrimal bone. Each of them is contributing 50% to its formation. However, in the cases of maxilla dominated uh, fossas, the maxillary bone constitutes a larger proportion, which can actually complicate the process of creating an ostium because it is difficult to perforate a maxilla bone because it is more thicker, right? So you basically you start your bony ostium creation through that sutural line because it is slightly weaker. In this illustration, you can actually observe a pink structure. Now, this pink structure is a nasal mucosa that has actually become visible as the bone is nibbled. A highly beneficial tool for establishing an osteotomy is this Kerison's bone nibbling ronja. Now, if you notice carefully, this structure actually bears a resemblance to that of a hockey stick. It has a J-shaped end design to actually guide the nasal mucosa forward or downwards. Now, if you were to insert your ronger here, so that J-shaped thing at the end is actually going to push down the nasal mucosa and then you are going to carefully, you know, place this instrument between the nasal mucosa and the bone during the operation and then very meticulously you are going to carry out your nibbling ensuring that there is no damage inflicted on the nasal mucosa as you enlarge your ostium. Now, it's very important to understand the ostium must be of adequate size, uh, which we generally quantitate as roughly about 10 to 12 millimeters. However, some scholars understand and advocate that even an 8 into 8 millimeters is acceptable and beneficial. Now, let us discuss the limits of this ostium, which is a commonly asked question. Now, anteriorly, you keep on nibbling your bone till the punch cannot be inserted anywhere further between the bone and the nasal mucosa. Posteriorly, however, it is delineated by the ethmoid bone. Now, the ethmoid actually harbors the aerated sinuses, so it's better not to meddle with that area. On the superior side, it is advisable that you don't cross your medial canthus uh, more than 2 millimeters, and inferiorly till you have deroofed the nasolacrimal canal. So, as you can see in this diagram, I'll try to explain. Anteriorly, it extends to a point till where you cannot, you know, punch further between or where you cannot insert further between the nasal bone and the nasal mucosa. Superiorly, it is about 2 millimeters above the medial canthus. Posteriorly, you don't have to cross this margin where you enter the ethmoidal bone. Inferiorly, you keep on extending till you make sure that the nasal acrimal canal is deroofed. An important uh, clinical nugget here is that an osteotomy which is performed too high or too superiorly could potentially lead to leakage of the cerebrospinal fluid. Furthermore, if you apply a torquing or a torsional motions um, while using the ronger, which was the instrument that we use for nibbling the bone, it can actually inadvertently extend the fractures in the bone superiorly, again causing the CSF to, uh, to leak because of the damage to the cribriform plate, right? So this too can again result in rhinorrhea. So it's very important that you don't cross, some people say don't cross this frontoethmoidal suture junction. So 
If a patient comes to you post-DCR with headache and a chronic rhinorrhea, that has to raise a suspicion of CSF leak. Another complication let us discuss in the event we have an insufficiently sized osteotomy created inferiorly. It will actually lead to accumulation of the tear of uh, tears in the lower part of the left lacrimal of the left lacrimal sac. So if you see over here, this osteotomy should this bone should also have been removed. However, since this bone is not removed, we can also say that the osteotomy is not completed inferiorly, or you have a very small osteotomy, because of which you have this redundant sac over here, which is called a sump. And in this sump, the tears are getting accumulated because of the gravity, and there is no effective drainage into the nasal cavity. Right? So this is called a sump syndrome. Now, how to treat this? Effective treatment for this predicament may actually include a surgical revision or utilizing a laser to enlarge the osteotomy in the inferior region. Next, the sixth step. Our task is now to identify the sac for the purpose of creating flaps within it. Now, we will be passing a Bowman's probe through an upper punctum an action which results in a lesser damage to the common internal punctum. Very important point. Now, as you put that Bowman's probe inside, the sac has to be identified at the junction of its posterior and medial border. And the process that what we are carrying out here is called the tenting of the sac, which helps in the identification basically. Now, it's very important to note that you should not damage the common internal punctum and that is the reason why you have to insert your Bowman's probe through an upper punctum and not through the lower punctum. It's very important. This common internal punctum is basically an opening into the common canaliculus and if this is damaged, it can actually cause a secondary closure of the common canaliculus finally leading to a failed DCR again. Now, in this diagram that you are observing, you will notice different structures represented by different colors. The blue color is what we call the lacrimal sac here, while the pink represents the nasal mucosa, right? So the blue one is the lacrimal sac, pink is the nasal mucosa. Now let's take a closer look. So you see here how a vertical incision is actually given both in the lacrimal sac and also in the nasal mucosa. In the case of lacrimal sac, it specifically extends from the fundus all the way up to the nasolacrimal duct. Similarly, a vertical incision is also made in the nasal mucosa. Now, after that, what you do is you have to create these horizontal uh, incisions, converting the I-shaped incision initially to an H-shaped incision, right? So this was like this. And since you created two horizontal incisions, uh, on the either ends of the vertical incision that is turned into an H-shaped incision, right? The purpose here is to create what we call flaps, okay? Two from both lacrimal sac and the nasal mucosa. Now, let's examine what happens next. Now, simplifying this for better understanding, you will observe that we now have anterior and posterior uh, lacrimal flaps and we have an anterior and posterior nasal flaps respectively. Now what we do at this point is that the posterior flaps that we found here, that is these ones, will actually be excised. Now if you excise the posterior flap, this is what you are left with. You are just left with the anterior flaps. And these finally, the anterior flaps are going to be sutured using a 6-0 vicryl suture. And this is actually going to create an osteum that has connected the sac with the nasal cavity and the tears can nicely flow into the nasal cavity, right? Now, the leading cause for DCR failure is often because of a soft tissue obstruction or at the, at the ostium. Also, sometimes a fibrous growth will also occur at the ostium. However, this can be successfully prevented by utilizing an antifibrotic agent like mitomycin C. The final step is the wound closure. So, after the ostium is created, after, this, after the flaps are sutured, you are post the orbicularis with 6-0 vicryl suture. The skin is also sutured now with 6-0 nylon or you can use silk. And in case of kids, even glue can be used to oppose the skin. As an extra measure, a number of surgeons often place silicon stents into the lacrimal system to guarantee an open osteum and the canalicular system. Now, some propose their use, especially in instances where there's a simultaneously, uh, where there's a simultaneous canalicular blockage. Quite logical, right? 
Now, these stents are generally taken out after a period of about 8 to 12 weeks, right? Nonetheless, there are uh, some who make the case that these stents can actually instigate a creation of biofilms and therefore should be removed at about a four-week mark. If a stent is, however, inserted, say, through both the parts of canalicular, as you can see in the first picture, that's called a bicanalicular stent. However, if it is inserted only through one part, then that's called a monocanalicular stent. Now, in this slide, I've actually summarized for you what are the various available bicanalicular stents and the monocanalicular stents. If you're interested to know more about stents, you can actually follow this article, a very uh, well-written article on, on nasolacrimal stents. Now, I'll just summarize the important points. So, basically, we start with an external incision. We separate the fibers of the orbicularis through blood dissection. We reach the medial palpable ligament. We identify it reflect the medial palpable ligament, reflect the periosteum and the sac laterally to expose the anterior lacrimal crest. Then we start the nibbling first at the suture, then extend the nibbling to create an osteum identifying the nasal mucosa in pink color. Then incisions are made vertical and the vertical incisions are then created into edge shape incision to create flaps. Anterior and posterior. Posterior flaps are excised, anterior flaps are finely sutured to create an osteum. Then the orbicularis and the skin is also opposed, leading to a bypass from the no, uh, from the eye into the nasal cavity, bypassing the nasolacrimal duct. So basically, we have DCR, we have an external conventional DCR, we have endonasal DCR, and we also have an endocanalicular laser DCR. Apart from that, we have a dacrocystectomy procedure where we actually remove the entire sac itself, and we also talked about the Lester Jones procedure or the conjunctival DCR. Uh, in the end, I would like to uh, mention what is DCT. In DCT, there is basically a complete surgical removal of the sac. It was a standard of care before the advent of DCR surgery for dacrocystitis and also for lacrimal fistula. However, even now, there are some special indications like the presence of tumors, a shrunken or a fibrous sac where you might want to remove the entire sac itself. Patient is too young to undergo DCR surgery or too old or there is a poor nasal mucosa because of gross atrophic rhinitis. So, if you found this video instructive and helpful, I would appreciate if you could indicate this by giving it a thumbs up. Your support to our channel is invaluable and you may express it by leaving a comment further. I encourage you to explore our video on lacrimal syringing and probing to further bolster your knowledge on the lacrimal diagnostic test. That's all for today. Thank you and have a nice day.